Welcome back. We are joined now by our panel of political experts, Matthew Clank, Caroline Heldman, Rafe Sonnenshine, and Robert Urtiaga. First, let's talk about Hillary. Matt, we'll start with you. She gave a big speech tonight, clearly shifting focus away from the primary season and focusing on Donald Trump in the general election. Of course, Sanders has something to say about that, perhaps. What did you make of her speech tonight? It was a fantastic speech. I mean, as she was, she made a historic speech, the first woman to ever uh, lead the ticket for a major party nomination in the, in, for the president of the United States. And she looked presidential. She was effective. She also offered a very, very sharp contrast with what I think you're going to see this November. Uh, she was pretty vicious about saying Donald Trump was not suited to be president of the United States. And I was going to say, you're we're going to hear Hillary and her surrogates hit that note over and over and over again because Trump just can't get out of his own way. Caroline, juxtapose that with the breaking news reported by the New York Times that uh, Bernie Sanders is preparing to lay off half his campaign staff tomorrow. What do you make of the news? I think Bernie Sanders is finally publicly acknowledging the math that he has lost this contest. His only hope going forward for a contested election is that he somehow changes the minds of superdelegates. And to date, he has changed zero minds. He has, ch he has gotten zero superdelegates to switch their position. It's an untenable position. Um, I think for the party's sake, he needs to do something right away. He needs to step out of the way. This is what's historically been done. He's breaking with history. Um, I think Hillary Clinton is maybe the person who best understands the pain that he he and his supporters are feeling tonight. She felt that in 2008, but the fact of the matter is, if you look at the math, it is over. She is the presumptive Democratic nominee. Rafe, I want to pick up on something Caroline said, that, that, sh that Bernie has not managed to move one superdelegate, which is true to this moment. But he insists that we haven't gotten to Philadelphia yet, and there's still time for him to change the minds. I think without California, he has very little room to maneuver. But, but he's holding on for what? What's he holding on for? He's holding on for influence at the convention, influence on the platform, and influence in the Democratic Party. But one problem he has, and it's shown by not getting superdelegates, he has no base in the organized situation of the Democratic Party. There's almost no elected officials at the top level. And unlike the Republican Party, the Democratic Party is still run by its political leadership and they still have the biggest say and he's got no voice with them as opposed to four years ago eight years ago both obama and clinton had a strong base in the democratic party leadership she got much closer to beating obama eight years ago than bernie is to beating hillary right now robert uh, bernie is threatening a quote messy convention his word how much leverage does he have over the platform I think he has quite a bit of leverage over the platform, and it would be to the, to the discredit of the Democratic Party if they don't listen to him and bring him into the umbrella. Give him some, uh, especially in the party platform. They've already given him uh, four, uh, four spots on the uh, Rules Committee. I think they'll continue giving him a little more. I think it's really up to Hillary to uh, meet with him. Um, see what, what more we can give without taking her too far to the left because that's what he's trying to do and I think she's trying to come back to the center so I think she really has to you know show him respect give him time and let him come to her uh, in his own time. That is the sort of tug of war that we're talking about on the left side here I mean it's a classic move on either side to move center for the general election and again, there's there's this resistance on the part of on the part of Bernie. Bernie doesn't want that. Bernie wants the Democratic Party to go left and stay left. I mean, Hillary negotiated Secretary of State when she met with Barack Obama and gave up in 2008. I would be highly surprised if Hillary Clinton offers Bernie Sanders a slot in her administration. What's he going to be? Secretary of Treasury? Secretary of Labor? He is not going to be where the Hillary, I would imagine, wants the mainstream of the Democratic Party to be come November of 2016. Yeah, but, but, but Bernie, Bernie, he says it's a movement. So he wants to fundamentally change the Democratic Party. So yes, he, he does. I don't think he wants a slot. He wants to fundamentally change the Democratic Party so we can focus on more issues like uh, bringing the minimum wage to $15, uh, $15 an hour, to make sure we have universal health care, to make sure that we break up the, the banks. They're too powerful. So he wants to fundamentally change the Democratic Party. So it's an ideology. It's not something he wants in particular. But Bernie's not the issue. Bernie's voters are the issue. Yeah. Those voters are the yeah. future. Yeah. They're the future of the Democratic right. Party. Yeah. And all the polls show they are considerably to the left of the old Democratic Party. And it's one thing to give Bernie a cabinet position, which is, which is never going to happen. But Hillary Clinton has to reach out to those voters because in the next 20, 30 years, that party will not survive without those voters. But and right. they want a different set of issues. Where are they going to go? 
Well, it's, with the Democrats, it's always a question of whether they're going to turn out and vote, including in off years, which Democrats have a terrible time doing. It is a huge battle for Democrats to energize their party. They've got this boiling revolt yeah. on the left, and Bernie is, was a great messenger for it. Excellent messenger. But imagine if he had been someone like Elizabeth Warren running that insurgency. Let's By the way, the she would have defeated Hillary Clinton. So the know. evolution of a movement, and, and I think we can all agree that's what we're seeing here, how does that affect change in Washington? I mean, you have you know, millions of people that are, that are supporting <laughs> Bernie Sanders and his causes. Are they going to march on Washington outside Mitch McConnell's office window and demand that, that things change? I mean, Congress ultimately makes the laws. But it means that Hillary Clinton is going to put those issues on the agenda. We already actually hear her using the rhetoric from Bernie Sanders. We, we hear, hear her talking about income inequality, for example. That's not language that is native to Hillary Clinton, right? So Bernie Sanders has already effectively shifted the tone and the agenda of this election. He, he's achieved his goal, and he'll continue to push for it at the Democratic Convention. I would be highly skeptical if the, if the language that Hillary uses mm -hmm. tonight about income inequality and the things that she talked about because of Bernie Sanders is the same type of language that she's using in October. Okay. It's going to be a much more centrist focused language to bring people into the party in large part because people are dissatisfied with Donald Trump but also I mean again the Trump voter or the, uh, the Sanders voters either they're going to vote for, they have nowhere to go. They're going to vote for Hillary. I want to shift the conversation to Donald Trump. Of course, he's been in the news lately, as he always is, this time for comments over a judge with Mexican heritage uh, presiding over his legal cases. We have sound bites today from both Paul Ryan and late this afternoon, Mitch McConnell, which is very unusual for him to speak in this tone regarding someone in his own party. Let's roll that sound, and then we'll get your reaction on the other side. This judge is giving us unfair rulings. Now I say why. Well, I want to, I'm building a wall, okay? And it's a wall between Mexico, not another country. He's, in not, my, he's not from Mexico. In my opinion, he's from Indiana. He is he's Mexican, Mexican heritage, and he's very proud of it. Claiming a person can't do the job because of their race is sort of like the textbook definition of a racist comment. I think that should be absolutely disavowed. It's absolutely unacceptable. And my advice to our nominee would be to start talking about the issues that, American, that the American people care about and to start doing it now. In addition to that, uh, it's time to quit attacking various people that you competed with or various uh, minority groups in the country and get on message. There it is from Senator Mitch McConnell, get on message. I mean, in, in no uncertain terms, he's sending it loud and clear across the spectrum. Absolutely. I mean, look, for Donald Trump to spend, what, a week now talking about a judge that he doesn't like for his Trump University case, I can't believe that that is what is going to move voters in the November general election. He should be talking about all of the things about taxes and the slowing economy and all the things that, that a traditional candidate would talk about. But with Donald Trump, all logic and reason goes out the window. Ryan's endorsed him. Ryan has endorsed him, which is a little troubling if you look at the fact that he admitted that he just engaged in textbook racism and it's not the first time in this election. And I'm not one of those pundits that is going to act like Donald Trump is a usual candidate or normal candidate. He has used incredibly xenophobic, racist language, misogynistic language over the years, and he is the Republican Party nominee. And the Republican Party is probably more angry about it than I am um, because he is, he'll, he'll probably lose the election for them. I think that Hillary Clinton could have been beaten by any of the other major Republican nominees except for Donald Trump. Yeah, I, I think in terms of Donald Trump, his statement he made is going to be a tipping point. I think they, they hit a saturation point with some of his crazy uh, remarks. And when you look back on this election, you'll see this is the time that the tide changed in Hillary's favor. So uh, I think I think this thing will is an important thing that everyone will see who Donald Trump truly is, and they will then parse all of his other statements and then take him for what he is. What do you see, Ray? I think the Republican leaders made a huge mistake to endorse him in exchange for nothing. They gave it away when they panicked when a poll showed that, he, that it looked like he was even with Hillary, and they thought they'd better get on board right away. But they didn't hold out for anything. They didn't hold out for any changes. Now they're in a position where they have to attack him for things he said, but feel they can't unendorse him. If they had waited, and said, let's see how he behaves, they might have actually had some leverage on his behavior. And I think now he's running wild, and they're regretting it. More to come with the four of you throughout the broadcast. For now, share Calvin back over to you.
We are now joined again by our panel of political experts, and we're going to delve into those uh, races a little bit more deeply. LA-based political consultant Matthew Klink, Occidental professor Caroline Heldman, the executive director of the Pat Brown Institute for Public Affairs at Cal State, LA Rafe, uh, Shun Sun and Shine, and Upward Solutions political consultant Robert Ortiaga. Let's talk about the Board of Supervisors race. We just saw right there that Janice Hahn, for example, um, is at 50 percent, and this could ultimately mean that tonight is it for her, and she doesn't have to go to November. That, that's the magic number mm -hmm. for for Congresswoman Hahn. She wants that 50 percent so that she can end this race right now. She's got name ID. She got the endorsement from the L.A. Times. She's proven herself as an elected official. Uh, I think she's probably going to get it, especially if turnout remains where it is. And she's running against someone who is an aide to Supervisor Kanabi, but I mean, he just doesn't have the name recognition and the accomplishments that Janice Hahn does. And also her father being, yeah, you know, part of the board for 40 years and Absolutely. that re name recognition as well must, must help as well. Don't you think? Absolutely. And it'll be historic if she, uh, if both of those seats in, that are open tonight end up uh, in November going Democratic, right? Because they'll have a supermajority. And we haven't seen this um, in 30 years on this board. And with the liberal move that we've seen in the last few years on the Board of Supervisors, we've seen much more liberal uh, programs for homeless individuals, uh, environmental pushes. So if they get the supermajority, um, we will actually see very different policies passed in Los Angeles. And what does it mean also when it comes to the point that it could be forfeits women on the on the on the board? Well, I think that's very significant, although not as significant as the party and ideological change, which is going to change all the policies of the board. But I think it may change the tone of the board. Mm -hmm. It's always been seen as kind of a closed off environment, kind of an uncomfortable place to go testify and sort of a secretive place. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if having different kinds of people in charge might actually have a salutary effect on a little bit more openness that that board could really use. And let's talk a little bit about the money that's at stake here and, and some of the programs that we were talking about. We've got $28.5 billion that they will be handling and that will affect uh, 10 million plus residents here in Los Angeles County. Tell us what that means. Well, what it means is the LA County Board of Supervisors handles our uh, mental health system, handles our you know LA County Medical Center, it handles uh, a, a lot of things. and you know. Having worked for Janice Hahn, I know how much she's focused on streets, sidewalks, potholes, the infrastructure, and I think LA's infrastructure is badly needed of improving. Uh, and I think Janice Hahn will bring an openness to um, LA County Board of Supervisors and bring a different path. So I'm glad. I hope she's, she wins it tonight. I, I'm ha very happy for her. And it was one of her dreams to always become an LA County Supervisor. She looks so much up to her father, and I think. I think today will be the day that she really, really achieves that goal that she following, wanted. Yeah, yes. Following in her father's footsteps, for yes. sure, if that is the case. In the meantime, let's turn to the Senate race. And we've got Kamala Harris and Loretta Sanchez. We just heard from Loretta Sanchez, of course. At that point, only about 6% of the precincts reporting. But it looks like those two, which have always kind of been uh, what we expected to be the top two vote getters. Now, let's talk about the top two system um, in our primary here in California and how that means it doesn't really matter what, where the Democrats Democrats, whether they're Democrats or Republicans. Let's talk a little bit more about that system. Well, I think it highlights a couple things. I think, one, it highlights how strong the Democratic Party is statewide in California, and then flip the coin over, and it also shows how weak the Republicans are. But let's also th talk about the 34 candidates that were on the ballot. I mean, there were, what, two full pages on the ballot with multiple, you know, there are multiple pages on this ballot. Make sure you read them all. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there were at least three Republicans candidates and once there were three candidates it was a foregone conclusion that the top two Democrats were going to be in the runoff. But can we talk about why it's a strong Democrat? It all happened in, when Prop 187 happened. It really changed the dynamic of California, opened up the sleeping giant and Latino electorate and I think Donald Trump's going to do the same nationwide for all, all underrepresented communities and so the reason why is that so the Republicans have to change their message. They have to start focusing on the issues instead of on you know 
people's heritage or ethnicities. Um, and so until they do that, California will be dominated, and you'll continue seeing these two Democrats in runoffs. Well, we also haven't had a Senate race, though, since 1994. Yeah. Correct. So. This is the first time, you know, with Barbara Boxer, um, you know, retiring, of course, opening up the chance for th this many candidates with 34. And, Caroline, we were talking about how confusing it was for so many people at the polls. Right, because the Senate race was split up on two pages, and the top two vote-getting candidates, the Democratic candidates, were on one page. Mm -hmm. So if you were to go to the next page, kind of in, I think what a lot of voters get into this kind of, oh, let me ink it, mode and flip, um, then you would have canceled out your own vote. And I know this was a statewide issue. I was looking on websites and on Twitter. People were complaining about this. Mm -hmm. um, so I, w I would suspect that there's a large number of discounted votes in this Senate race. All right. But the votes that have been counted, though, have gone to Kamala Harris at the, as the number one contender right now with um, her rival, Loretta Sanchez, that will make it over to November. We're going to get back to you guys in a little bit. Thank you so much. In the meantime, Micah, back to you. Welcome back. We are joined again by a panel of political experts, Matthew Klink, Caroline Heldman, Rafe Sonnenschein, and Robert Urtiaga. Let's talk about the growing sort of inevitability of a Clinton-Trump matchup in a general election. Uh, most of the polls will favor Hillary Clinton by a few points. I've seen at least one poll with Trump within the margin of error. So we're talking about a close race at this point, hypothetically. Uh, but we also see where at least a third of Sanders supporters would not vote for Hillary Clinton. What do you make of the dynamic at this point? I think that she uh, will actually have an easier time than Barack Obama did in 2008. More people today, Sanders supporters, say that they will support her in the general election than back then. And if you remember, there was a lot of vitriol, there was a lot of pain mm -hmm. on both sides, and people came out to support the other candidate in the general election. So I think it's overblown. What do you think, Matt? I was going to say exactly, and I think, Micah, that I would anticipate one of the more negative personal elections and with, that we've had in a recent number of years and I think that Hillary should be thanking her looking stars because she now has the distinction of being the second most unpopular candidate to run for president with Donald Trump being the first. It will be scorched earth policy by both of them in part because Donald Trump is not an ideological candidate. He has a cult of personality and she's going to have to match him blow for blow. Rafe, in, in one sense Donald Trump is on Hillary Clinton's side because you look at this and you say opposition and disagreement is a much more powerful force than agreement with your candidates, say. And he's stirring a lot of blood. Well, he's scary because he generates a lot of energy, but this is going to be the first campaign I've ever seen in my life where the entire campaign is about the human being who's on one side of it. And it has taken Hillary Clinton months to come to a voice to say, he is temperamentally unfit to be president of the United States. That's her single best line she's had. They've been experimenting with some of the most idiotic lines I've ever heard, calling him two word names, dangerous Donald, silly stuff like that. This is the first time I've heard her actually summarize the entire case against him, which is that he's temperamentally unfit. It's not going to be an issues campaign because he doesn't run on issues. No, absolutely. He just says whatever pops into his head and then my changes it the next day. Robert, can he yeah. overcome that? <laughs> I think he can overcome that, but I, like President Clinton said, presidential elections are not about the past, they're about the future. So I think Hillary Clinton has to get what her message is. She has to be clear. Bernie Sanders had a message. Hillary Clinton now has to have a clear, distinct message for his supporters. On top of that, she's going to have to jab him a little bit, um, compare and contrast like, like she did at the, her national uh, policy speech, and then laugh a little more, show she's having a good time. And I think people will see her as a real candidate, and the Democrats will flock to her and, and eventually lead her to the White House. Yeah, but, Micah, look, I mean, the reality is the reason why Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders did well, and they're on the opposite sides of the same coin, people are scared. The economy is not strong. America is positioned in a weaker spot in the world right now, in a large part because of the last eight years. So Hillary Clinton has a very delicate balancing act of embracing Barack Obama's agenda, the parts that she likes and she thinks are going well, and differentiating herself because we know Donald Trump is going to embrace nothing and he's just going to do a scorched earth policy and try to scare people into voting for it. Spending is going to be very relevant in this general versus the primary. You saw Donald Trump simply make a comment 
incident that got under somebody's skin and it became the headline every day, uh, seemingly, of the primary where you look at basically free coverage. He's going to have to spend money in this general election uh, and, and rely not so much on, on headline-making statements as he is getting to the issues if he has a chance. Do you believe that? He seems like he has very little money on hand and very little prospect of raising more money, which is surprising to say about a billionaire money candidate. Money will be a problem for either. But at the same time, he really has a serious message problem because he can only go so far with what he's got at this yeah. point. And by the way, I would take issue with what Matt said. The president's popularity is now over 50 percent for the first time in years. There's a much more negative feeling within the Republican Party about the state of the country than there is in the rest of the country, including Democrats and independents. And President Obama is, wants to jump in this race precisely to contest what you just said, Matt, which is to say, we're not going off a cliff. Uh, the country's not going to hell in a handbasket. 39,000 jobs created the last month, 97 million Americans out of work, lowest, low state of approval of America overseas. I wouldn't call that good. Well, of course, you picked one month of job creation, which was an averaging they, about 200,000. And a they month. just dropped down the preceding yeah. quarter to. But, but at I the guess, end of the day, yeah. it's not going to be about policy, yeah. right? At the yeah, end of the I day, agree. it's, it's going to be about personality. Yeah. It's going to be scorched earth. <laughs> and I think what we haven't talked about is the incredible sexism that we're going to see, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. We, we saw it revealed on the left with hashtag shrillery and all of the talk from some Bernie supporters about the way Hillary Clinton looks. We actually heard the first super sexist thing that Donald Trump said a few days ago about Hillary Clinton which is that she doesn't look presidential. And what he's saying is she doesn't look like the typical president. She's not a white man or she's not a man. So a campaign it's going to be ugly. Any we've covered. That's correct. Okay, panel, thank you. More with you shortly. Share over to you. Welcome back to our election special. We are here with our panelists, and uh, we want to ask you about what you think about what happened yesterday and what, how that played into today's primary. We're talking about the AP factor that had said pretty much Hillary Clinton has clinched a nomination if enough delegates. What do you think, Rafe? Oh, I thought it was a spoiler, like your favorite TV show, hearing mm -hmm. the plot. Uh, they don't even get to watch the show. It's a completely unnecessary story. Mm -hmm. It really wasn't news because those delegates don't get to vote till July. So they went to all the trouble to take the air out of the balloon of the only time our primary has last, you know, really mattered in years. There's a reason we don't report exit polls in November before the polls close in a particular state, but no such rules seem to exist for this kind of cockamamie primary thing. I thought it was a story that wasn't an evil story, but didn't add anything that the voters needed, any information they needed. They needed to wait, case. right? They needed Until to they not, got all of they the needed delegates to wait a date, you But know? it does fit the narrative that the mainstream media has been in the bag for Hillary Clinton since this thing started. But, oh, but she, she wasn't she, happy she, about she, this. No, no, no the well, that was yeah. the, yeah. the ultimate irony story. about it is it stole her thunder. Right. right. Because she wants to win and say, look what I did of my own accord. Right. And it also depressed voter turnout. We had 2 million people register in California since the beginning of the year. And what, a 40% turnout? Yeah. We had 50% in 2008. It should have been at least 50%. In the, right. end, in the end, it didn't matter because the vote by mails were strong for Hillary Clinton. 49%, right. there was 3.1 million absentees turned in. 49% were Democrats, 27% Republicans, 70% independents. So Hillary was going to have a, a large lead going to this anyway. So it would have been a lot closer. She probably was going to win by 5 or 6%, and it's going to turn into 12 to 14%, which is unfortunate. You know, we were talking about how Bernie Sanders also, you know, said, hey, you know, why is the media calling this? Just wait a second. We still have tomorrow. And Hillary Clinton, as you mentioned yesterday on Monday, says we still have six states to, that are going to the polls tomorrow. Yeah, it's, it's not a conspiracy. Mm -hmm. I mean, basically, this was just media competition. They yeah. thought they had yes. a story ahead of everybody else. They had worked on it for a long time. They suddenly said, we've got it. We've got Let's numbers. go with Let's it. Go we go got ahead. it before the primary held. We've got this news hold that everybody's paying attention to California. What a great time to get our story on. All that being said, she wanted Bernie Sanders out sooner rather than later so that it's a... It's the two-person race that she wants to focus on for the next six months, in which case I think she, she's getting ready for it. And, Rafe, you said it. She appears to have found the narrative that has gotten under Donald's hair or skin, depending <laughs> on which one. Do you have any ideas or, on, um, and thoughts about running mates for both, um, you know, both sides? <laughs> yeah, I know we talked about we this one earlier, right? Yeah. 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 Some interesting names that you're coming up with, though, for Hillary's camp and for uh, Donald Trump's camp. I said Tim Kaine. Uh, senator from Virginia, fluent in Spanish, uh, was chair of the DNC, gets Washington, but he's from a purple state, so he brings something to the equation. 
Um, and I don't know anybody who would want to be Donald Trump's vice president. So, <laughs> I think that Donald Trump would do great with Nikki Haley. He needs a woman. He needs a person of color. He is in real serious trouble with both both groups. Um, but I could see, you know, Tom Perez uh, as Hillary's uh, vice president. But also, Kane, I think he's great, right? Because she needs a man on the ticket. A man of color would be great, but not necessary. But she needs a man in order to anchor her ticket mm -hmm. because women are still challenged as not quite as competent leaders. But you said that you were mentioning a woman's name when we were in the green room as maybe possibly a, 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 a or was it, I'm sorry, rape, it was rape, that you were mentioning a woman's name. I think name. Elizabeth Warren would That's be the, the best one. choice. And I think the reason, the same reason we argued off camera that I didn't believe in Tim Kaine is Tim Kaine is a pretty dull color candidate in the sense, his ideology, his thought. She needs to energize those Sanders voters and I think it'll take the air right out of the balloon. I, 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 I kind of disagree. I, I think Bernie Sanders needs to energize his voters. So he has to play a key role in this uh, in the general election. I think Obama and Sanders, if they do it right, they could shore up the base, all of Bernie supporters, and it's, it won't really even matter who the Democratic uh, vice president pick in the end is. But I do think, I agree with him, Tim Kaine is probably a logical pick for it's her. It's got to be value added. There are about nine states that are going to determine who the next president is. If they don't bring anything to the table, they're not worth choosing. And okay. they got to bring And you think for no, no, you, you haven't come up with a name for, for Donald Trump's camp? I, th I think Joni Ernst Haley. From, Joni Ernst from Haley Iowa. There. I mean, from Iowa. She's a tea party darling, and I think she fits his mold. Mm -hmm. The I hardest so. question is whether you want to be his running My mate and be exactly. in the shadow, not be allowed yeah. to speak, uh -huh. and have yourself tethered as the Republican leaders are finding right now to whatever he says is going to stick to you. Well, it could so, be a career ender for a Republican. Therefore, you know, we, we, Chris Christie would be the best because his career's got nowhere to go at this point. And he, would, <laughs> and he would like the job. He's auditioning for the job. These are these are statements, you know, and, and when we see what, what we've seen with the GOP debates, we saw how Donald Trump was essentially able to smear his um, opponents and get to the point where he is now. This is going to, at one point or another, Hillary Clinton and, and Donald Trump will be debating. Do you think that these tactics that he used during the GOP debates are going to work in a, in, the, in a general election debate? No, because there's not going to be seven or ten people on stage. There's going to be 90, you know, 90 minutes of three-minute questions and one-minute rebuttal. You can only demean your opponent for so long, and then you have to talk about substance, and pretty soon people are going to see if there's any there there for Donald Trump. And right now, listen to what he talks about. He makes one statement with no substance behind it. You can't do that in a debate. And Hillary Clinton, for all of her criticisms, criticisms about not being good, she knows policy. She can talk the Washington talk, and she knows how to bills become laws, and that's where she's going to be really effective. Yeah. Caroline, I mean, Donald Trump is going up against arguably the most qualified presidential candidate we've ever had. Maybe George Herbert Walker Bush is in that camp, uh, but at the end of the day, Donald Trump is actually going to have to have some policy yeah. proposals in order to match her. Mm -hmm. She has to be careful not to defend herself, mm -hmm. and uh, she may want to if he insults her, mm -hmm. and the minute you're defending yourself, you're in trouble. I think what she ought to do is yield some of her time to him. <laughs> And just say, keep going. I don't need my three minutes. Keep just fin talking. finish your thought. And, yeah. your, and your final thought, <laughs> set, Robert? Set a Washington As official go. She's going to run circles around <laughs> Donald Trump and policy. Why? Because she's done it. Mm -hmm. She's done it. She doesn't need to make it up. She doesn't need to learn it. She just has no learning curve. So Hillary Clinton. Robert, I thank you so much, Caroline and Matt, for being here on our panel tonight. We really do appreciate your time and your thoughts. Micah, over to you.